grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome today. We are looking at the topic Christ all surpassing worthiness, the all surpassing worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no better food than Christ, there is no greater light than Christ, there is no more impactful life like Christ. He is everything, He is our all in all as man he created us and even as his children the redeemed of the Lord there is no better person to see no better need for humanity than this person of the Lord Jesus Christ his person cannot be exhausted anything about him whether it is his power his salvation his life his spirit his works his priesthood his wisdom everything about him is in finance so today we are looking at his all surpassing worthiness first let's start who can portray the beauties of christ's person and works it's it, 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 it's it's um, it's um, unportrayable so to say nobody can fully comprehend everything about him because he is the mystery of god he is whatever has been revealed to us from scriptures and by the spirit is to the measure god has considered sufficient enough for our work with him so every day the, the heart the soul the spirit of man is longing for more food on the person of Christ. He's unsearchable. He's uh, the unlimitedness of his person. So every day we keep beholding him until we have strength. We keep beholding him until we are formed. I love the song. I think it's a German song, uh, Theophilo. The song, we behold until we are formed, we behold until we have strength, is the one we are beholding, the Lord Jesus Christ, until he is formed in us. He appears as humanity robed in deity, in divinity, in his incarnation, because this is God manifested in the flesh. That alone is, in, is enough mystery that is in uh, on. Uh, undemystifiable <laughs> it's, de it's undemystifiable in every sense and uh, you know what i mean nobody can comprehend that part of incarnation of god becoming flesh how can god the immortal god become or confined to mortality so he appears as humanity robed in deity in his incarnation when he came to save us he had to do that because there was no other way man could be saved because if any creature that commits an offense, it must be from that same lineage of creature that will come to be the solution. And But there was no perfect man to do it. So God had to become flesh, become us, so that he could pay the price for our sins. So is God linked to our lowly flesh or to our humanity? He took on the seed, the nature of the seed of Abraham and not of angels. God could have decided to help the fallen angels. <laughs> they probably, as someone said, might have brought him more revenue of glory than man but in his infinite kindness in his mercy in his compassion towards us creatures and uh, human man he has robed himself brought himself low linked himself to our lowly flesh so we go through the books uh, the gospels and we see clearly how god lived the human life the sufferings he went through the manifestations of what god what man was supposed to be without the fall i mean everywhere he went he was doing good so is god linked to our lowly flesh so it's a mystery in itself when you talk about the mystery of incarnation how did god become flesh it's a mystery because god remains god yet he is man in the person of the lord jesus christ and it doesn't mean that it was when he became man that the jesus christ of the godhead was created no 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 he has god is mysterious god is trying god is one but trying god is the father the son and the spirit is a mystery we've had few <laughs> teachings on that i'm sure you can do more studies on that about the trinitarian or the trinity of god so god remains god and yet he is man it's a mystery in itself truly god and truly man fully god and fully man and yet when we now became his children in the person of the lord jesus christ through the uh, the substitutionary work of the lord jesus christ man in christ remains man and yet is one with god how do you explain that that we are living in god and god is living in us it's a mystery that it will take all of eternity to be able to comprehend this so despite we are not god deity to be worshipped but we have god in us and we're in god and we are one with him 
1 Corinthians 6, 8 to, and that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And we are members of his body. So the, one of the things, the, uh, the worthiness or the all-surpassing worthiness of our Lord Jesus Christ is because he's a good and all good savior, so to say. I mean, gold, savior, gold is a very symbolic of royalty. It's like the premium of the power. Don't talk about silver and bronze and become very near with gold. So it's an ongoing saving, and we can see this template in the temple whereby many things like the Ark of the Covenant was overlaid with gold. There's something God was trying to bring out there that all the golden items in the temple showed him the golden altar, the golden lampstand, the golden utensils, the golden pot, the Ark that was overlaid with gold. All were revealing him, revealing his royalty as a king, revealing his supremacy over any form of thing, over any form of thing we consider to be uh, a treasure is an all good savior so to say even his rope i think i think in revelation chapter one talks about i mean the i believe the scepter the golden scepter his wings are spread over every spot on the earth and when we talk about the wings and by the mercy of god as the lord lead we we'll still do another topic uh, in the future as the lord lead under God's wings, because we think we go to the Old Testament, we saw in Deuteronomy where God says that He bore in Exodus, I think Exodus 19, that He bore Israel on His wings. Uh, Isaiah 40, those that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. And Sam, the psalmist said a lot about the wings of God. Psalm 91 is an example. Those who abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, those, uh, those who abide under the shadow of the Almighty shall, let me, let, Psalm 91. He that abides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we see of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. And we see that the wings of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, God, you know that God in Christ is spread over every. There's no spot. That's why He could tell us in the Great Commission that go into the world, lo, I am with you always. His wings are. And the wings, maybe let me not jump ahead, <laughs> but in the topic there, we talk about the gods, how God uses. The wings of the birds liking to his care for his people how the birds are very protective of their young ones how the wings of the birds are even used as a form of warmth uh, a shelter for them but let's just leave that for now that the wings of the lord jesus christ are spread over every spot on the earth his life is ours that we may live forever and that's why he said that because i need you will live also so the life he has given to us is the life of God, the Zoe life of God. So that life is ours. It's a, it's one of the most, will I say, the greatest assets we have in life because there is no answer that is not in this life. There is no solution or there is no situation we find ourselves that that life doesn't have the ability to bring us as overcomers. It's a different thing if we're going to allow that life to grow in us and because we feed that life we meditate on that life we feed it with the word of god just like any life i mean any creature that is not there's life in every creature but if you don't feed that life it can't grow it can't mature so the life of god in us needs to be fed with the word of god it needs to be baited in the place of prayer so that the maximum effects could be felt in our life for the job what about his death his death is uh, so that we will never what die because he said, because I leave, you will die also. And when we're talking about this death, there's the physical death and there's the spiritual death, right? To be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life and peace, as Romans 8 says. So this death we are talking about, it. there's a time we're not going to live in this physical, this jacket, these garments of our flesh, of our body forever here. We will receive a glorified body. That's why the scripture says that to be absent for the body is to be present for the Lord. So we're saying that we will never die, we will never because his death is ours, he took our place. He became who we are so that he could make us who he is in his life and in his nature. So his death is ours so that we may never die. That is, we will never be separated from God for us, meaning that keep aligning and beholding him and walking with him. So when we look at this attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot but just bow in adoration to his all-surpassing worthiness. No strength can stand before Christ. No strength, no sickness can stand before Christ. No 
darkness can stand before Christ. No powers of hell can stand before Christ. So that's why in everything that we are doing, our life is giving glory and adoration to Him because there is no substitute to Him. There is no backup to Him. There is no powers that can stand before Him. Our strength is in Him. Our joy is in Him. Our hope is in Him. Our everything we have in life is in Him. And so every time where he's always calling us back to himself to behold him to look unto him to depend upon him so that in everything we are doing our eyes is set on the person of the lord jesus christ there is no better thing to behold than him there is no better there is no nothing higher than him to look unto so no strength can stand before christ no sickness and so that that gives that's what makes him us also passing means that something cannot be better than something cannot be superior to so there is no strength there is no power and this the and we are in him we are members of his body so this is great joy to us this is comfort to us in any situation that we are bound to overcome as we keep beholding him and aligning ourselves to him what is again is part of the all surpassing worthiness is righteousness is what is also that we can stand before god and this one by the mercy of god god is helping you to be grateful for the privilege for you and I as believers in Christ to be able to stand before God. It is not easy. It is not um, easily accessible to, for anybody to stand before any dignitary or the president of your nation. It's not any citizen that can come there because of the schedule they are dealing with and uh, not everyone can be before them. Even in the days of old, in the, for example, in the Old Testament, nobody could stand before Nebuchadnezzar. It has to be the premium, the, the best of the pack like in the case of Daniel, that can stand before the king. And so the privilege we have today that we can stand before God. I was reading, um, just meditating on, I've been meditating on Hebrews chapter 10 for some time now, a few months. Hebrews 10, the TPT version, it talks about verse 19. And now we are brothers and sisters. And now we are brothers and sisters in God's family because the blood of Jesus, and he welcomes us to come into the most holy sanctuary in the heavenly Realm, boldly and without hesitation, for he has dedicated a new and life-giving way for us to approach God. For just as the veil was torn in two, Jesus' body was torn to give us free and fresh access to God. So he made us in his image that we may be carriers of his authority. That is, um, he made us in his likeness in Genesis chapter 1. So that because image represents authority, for example, you have a coin or a currency in your, the nation you're dwelling in it. The image or you call it the imprint or the seal of that nation is on that currency. That means you have authority depending on the value that is imprinted there. You have authority to exchange. That's why it's called a legal tender. So God creating us in his image and likeness means that God has given. That's why we could have dominion on the earth. Of course, that was before the fall. Now, after the fall, that dominion, it's, a man handed it over to the devil through the fall through disobedience but christ has now come to put us back into the position if not higher than we were before the fall so that's why we have it says all power and authority has been given unto me so that was why we have carriers of his authority that means we can declare over situations that are anti-scriptures over sickness powers of darkness we have authority over them but of course it doesn't just happen overnight there's a place of growing in the law forming I mean, growing in the knowledge of God. I mean, uh, being strengthened in our inner man. There's a lot. No human, every human being has the ability, I believe, to develop muscles. But there are regiments, there are routines, there are spirit exercises, so to say, to build up those muscles so that it can have authority. So that we're not just having power. Sorry, we're not just having authority, but we have the power to enforce that authority that has been given to us. His crown fits no mortal head. Because... And it's not just a few crowns that the Lord Jesus Christ sees. It's tons, tons of crowns, so to say. I will go by revelation that upon his head are many crowns. So the crowns that he has fit no mortal head. Yes, we have our own crown. My daughter was looking at it and saying, yeah, but I thought we were going to wear a crown. You know, I'm like, yeah, there are crowns and there are crowns. Uh, you can't wear my shoe, though there are shoes, but <laughs> the crown of the Lord Jesus Christ is the crown of majesty. It is incomparable. His love is as... We could say is as wide as the human race and as free as the sunshine. 
the sun never rejects anybody that comes to it. It doesn't discriminate against anyone. So we could almost say the loving kindness of our Redeemer is unsurpassing because it is as free as the sunshine. He said, I, anyone that comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Could you imagine that? That anyone that comes to him, he will by no means cast down. That means he's, uh, um, uh, he, he, he has an open disposition to everyone. Everyone that comes through the repentance and not just trying to play funny games. So his love is as free as the sunshine. However you want to drench yourself, the sun is not going to say you've had enough, go away. No, you are the one that will get tired. Actually, the sun doesn't go down. It's just the earth that is moving around. If the earth stays wet, if it were possible, the sun will continue to shine. What a joy. His arm is omnipotent. So we're talking about being the all-powerful one. Or else, what other powers or extraordinary st strengths can trample down satanic rage or the rage of demonic spirit, the rage of men, <laughs> unfriendly men or ungodly men. So only him, because of his everlasting arm, we're talking about the arm that created the heavens and the earth. The arm that can destroy, that can make war and make rich. The arm that can elevate and can also bring down. The arm that enthrones things. What a joy to the greatness of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so many of his attributes are all everywhere, are all true scriptures. And the more we are meditating upon him, we find strength. So we meditate upon the Lord. Um, we are transformed from glory to glory. He said that yeah, that uh, uh, that um, uh, that they look unto him and they were lighting and they were not put to shame. We look unto him and we are lighting. I mean, it's innumerable benefits we have meditating on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, meditating on his person, his works, his characters. What a joy! So, despite his majesty, he is approachable. None may fear him. And when I mean fear, I mean the fear of dread or running away. We fear the Lord. That's say the fool says there's no God. The fool says that that, that fear is some is rev there's a place of reverence and there's also the place of dread as in terror in a negative kind of a sense. And I'm sure for those who are parents, you don't want your children having the dread like a terror. No, no, no. There's a place of reverence and there's also so what we mean here is a classical place of um, no need to dread him like a terror. And that's why, like I'm, I was reading Hebrews 10, 19 for the believers, they said we can come boldly. Hebrews 4, 16 also said that let us come boldly to the throne of grace. We can't come boldly if we are, I mean, if, if we are all shaking and thinking that he's going to destroy us. No, no, no. Despite his majesty, he has made himself achievable to us. We couldn't have earned it. We couldn't have merited this access we have to God. That's right there, whether in, the, in your place of work, whether in the kitchen, whether in driving in the air, or in the boardroom, in the White House, wherever you are, that you have access before God. And is there a need for that? Yes, because we need wisdom from Him. We need power from Him. We need strength from Him for every situation. Because there's nothing he expects us to do in our own strength. And so we always need to stand before our standing is not just the physical standing, it's the posture of the heart. You could be sitting in a boardroom and yet you are standing before God because your heart is attuned to him that, Lord, what is the solution to this situation here? Lord, may I be able to manifest your light in this environment? So it's always, a, that's why we do pray without ceasing. Imagine that he who is clothed with glory should be wrapped with rags of flesh. It's one of the mysteries of his mysterious condescension. The infinite becoming finite so as to redeem the finite and bring us to the state of his, I mean, to the heavenly place he is. So part of his also passing worthiness is that, look, the angels could appreciate him and sing. The holy angels can sing of his greatness, his glory, his holiness. But here we are like, wait, there's the parts to appreciate you for who you are. And there's also the parts to say that, look, you could still have remained who you are and we fallen human nature will still be in our pit or in our wretchedness. But yet you took up our wretched flesh so that you could save us. Oh, what a mystery. He who fills heaven. Could you imagine that he will feel seven be cradled in a manger? You know, usually uh, the shepherds would cradle the young lambs in the 
manger so that um, it's protected, like you take care. And sometimes, because sometimes uh, this, they needed that protection. So you could imagine, because they couldn't defend themselves, but just imagine the Most High God in His incarnation who fills heaven, that even heaven cannot contain Him, because uh, if people say heaven can contain Him, then we ask, where was heaven? Before God created them, where was containing God? So be cradled in a manger. Part of the reason, these are part of the reason why we pour our hearts in adoration to Him, in thanksgiving to Him for who He is, for what He's doing in our life, and what He will continue to do. That you feel heaven and earth, and yet you condescended to the point whereby you could be confined to a manger, to be confined to a mortal body. He is God in our nature taking our place in death in order to bring us to his place in immortality of immortality <laughs> it's a mystery and I, we read the psalm and um, in all great um, respect to david and, and the others the psalmist as well i mean we our own psalms those psalms were are relevant for eternity, but our own psalms is another dimension entirely because we are looking at the, we are looking at, yes, the greatness of God, the person of Christ, what He has done for us. Almost all the epistles we could turn them to psalms because we are appreciating Him for what He has done. That you took David could not say he took his took their nature because then the price had not been paid. It was animals and it was offering us a temporary measure but here we are that's why god had to give us a language of tongues to bless him because he has done so much more for us in our dispensation so is god in our nature that is god manifested in the flesh taking the seed of abraham taking our place in death the death we ought to die because the soul that sinners should die the death that belonged to us he took it it became the as the lamb of god took our death as a brazen serpent as well so that we can hold him in order to bring us to the place of his immortality that is now that's why you could say um, um, because i live you will live also whoever believes in me shall not die and so it's 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 a place of honor that we are seated with him in heavenly places and that's why for eternity we'll be singing his praise for what he has done in our life what he's doing in our life that divine exchange money could not buy it. the wealth of the wealthy cannot purchase this the skill of the skillful can never be able to merit the exchange or substitution that god has done in our behalf noah was not so saved in his act as we are in christ yes there was safety in the ark, but the ark wasn't forever the ark is an emblem of christ i believe is a shadow which many theologians also agree with the noah's ark was a was foreshadowing the person of christ in the sense that it's protected everyone in the ark from the deluge that was going on and there was only one ark then and there is only one mediator between god and man so this ark that we are in because we say the ark of christ is an ark of safety and after 40 days i believe of course the they had to get out of the ark but not so for us because we are in him is in us for eternity and so noah was not as safe in the car as in the ark as we are in christ because we are members of his body and so there's more to our life. Our life is hidden with Him in God. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. So wherever we are, we are not just by ourselves. We are not just in ourselves. We are not just of ourselves. We are in Him. We are of Him. We are by Him. That's why Paul could say that I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. Christ lives in me. So as God is the root of David, is the source of David, it's a mystery in itself how is the root of David. If it's also from the rod from the stem of Jesse, it's also the offspring of David, as blind Bartimaeus was calling him that uh, uh, Jesus, that son of David. How is it possible? Because uh, David again symbolizes, we could say, in terms of maybe a king and he was coming in that line. And so as God is the source, the root of David, as man is the offspring because he's from that lineage of David. He is the unobstructed way and mysterious ladder that unites earth to heaven. That's why I could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other medium or, will I say, a point of contact or ladder. There is no, there is no access to God, to divinity outside of him. 
because he is the one that the Father is dwelling in you. There's no other route to go. There's no other way. So it's the unobstructed way. He is the way. And it's also the ladder, like the case of Jacob's ladder of the angels ascending and descending, that unites it to heaven. So where we are right now, we, we are, we, as believers, we are dwelling in two realms, the realm of the heavenly and the realm of the physical, because Christ is making his home in our hearts. So there's that ongoing, uh, un, uh, interrupted as we align ourselves with him, communion between us and the Spirit of God. What is mercy if not Christ in his finished work? And so we can't celebrate mercy or any attributes of God, whether it is power. What is the power of God if not Christ? What is the wisdom of God if not Christ? What is the holiness of God if not Christ? Who is the light of God if not Christ? So the mercy of God that we are vessels, as Romans says, we are vessels of mercy, is nothing but Christ in his finished work. And we aligning ourselves, we having that, um, uh, the, the mercy of God, or would I call it the compassion of God, in bringing us to that point whereby we accept and we have faith. Because even faith, we can attribute it to ourselves. It's God that gives us the material so that we can believe. Yes, God will not see for us, but God gives us eyes that we may see. So God gives us faith so that we can believe. We can't claim that to be our. That's why I said it's not of works, but it is of grace. Every drop of his work is infinite compassion. Every part of him. Whether when he was dying for us on the cross, it was compassion that was there. That's why I could say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Whether even in today, as a high priest, Hebrews talks about it, how he's living to make intercession for us. This is a compassion that has that is unlimitable. This is a compassion that has no beginning and neither does it have an end. So every part of what he's doing, whether as the as the overseer, the bishop of our soul, as the true vine of our life, as our sanctifier, as the head of the church. Every part, everything is doing for us as his children is saturated with his infinite compassion. And that's why the same measure is expected of us as well in our living and relating with one another. That there's that compassion of God that is in us because he, what is doing to us is supposed to sprout or Awake a zeal in us by his spirit so that we can also reflect him to others as well in our dealings. Is the mirror of God's loving heart. That is, the mirror is what you look at, right? You look at yourself. So if you want to see the heart of God, is the one we look at. I want to know what is the desire of God. What is the plan of God for this nation so that I can begin to intercede? I look at Christ. What is the plan of God for my life? What is the vision of God for my family? What is the, God, the purpose of God for this church? I look at Christ and I will see exactly what is in the heart of God. So it's the mirror that is what? Reflecting everything, God's loving heart, God's plan, God's purposes. And it's also even the means to bring about what is in the heart of God. And I believe as well, the day and age where we are living in, Think, and there's a call for us to rise up from looking at God's hand to looking at God's heart or his, his face that because you could be looking at the hand because of what he wants to give but we are looking at what is the burden in your heart what is the desire of your heart how do we fit into the picture to begin to bring to manifest on earth what you have in heaven that's why your will be done on earth as it is in heaven it takes our prison rags that he may bear our prison woes who could have been able, and this is not, of course, the physical prisons we see around us are what, um, I mean, uh, pictures, so to say. <laughs> yes, they are physical in a sense, but this, the invisible prisons are probably more terrible than the physical ones because people are not unconscious that they are in kind of a prison and the wounds that are there, the bondage and what have you. So it took our prison rags so that he can bear our prison woes. That's why he says that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Also mentions about that, uh, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Also, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that uh, now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What a joy that what God in Christ is doing on our behalf. He, we have the breath of life because he breathed it into us. The breath of life inside of us is the breath, and this I'm talking about the breath in resurrection, because when he breathed on the disciples, we were in them, right? 
So that breath he imparted onto them, we are part of that beneficiary. He breathed it into the new creation, which anyone that appropriates or lay up faith on him also come under that same, uh, will I call it, realm, where the breath of the Almighty is in us, and which is the beginning of the new creation in a sense. You know, God made man out of the dust of the earth, breathed it into him, he became a living soul. And now in the new creation as well, it was still the same breath. It is because... He has breathed into us that we have that breath of life, not breath of human life. There's the breath of the human life, which is just maybe the regular um, life man is supposed to live. Of course, which became corrupt after man fell. But this is the breath, I believe, of Zoe life, a superior life, an everlasting life, not in terms of length, but in terms of quality. The life that is in God as well, what a joy. He endows us with all he is and all he has. He has endowed us with all he is and all he has. Apart from his deity and his Godhead, that's why we are not items to be worshipped. Because so whether it is his power, his attributes, his angels, his spirit, I mean, you could imagine the Avalon. That's why the scripture calls it the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he has endowed us in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, with all he is, that is his person, his priesthood, he has our bishop, and uh, the overseer of our soul as our great shepherd as our physician every part he has he, it's like he has willed himself to us that he is now our inheritance and we are also his inheritance a mutual inheritance so to say every of his perfection is for our enjoyment everything i could almost say that is on the throne for our good i'm not saying that the reasons on the throne is for us alone but i'm saying for our benefit as well and because that's why he became the testator of the New Testament, because um, so that what he died for could be a reality in our life. So we are enjoying his perfection, his finished work, the glory that he has, because we are one with him, we are united with him, we are not of our own, we are not our own strength. Which other shoulder can sustain the weight of man's countless sins? Said upon the shoulder, the government shall be upon the shoulder. Let me read that from. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and upon his shoulder that uh, the government shall be Isaiah 9 verse 6 unto us a, for unto us a child is born and it, for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given that the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace verse 7 of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and upon his kingdom no order to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts we perform it so the government shall be the government of god essentially what force can close hell what other force can close hell <laughs> <laughs> he is the authority because the key of hell and death is in his hands. <laughs> so we're talking about an all-surpassing worthiness of the person of our Savior. So you could have access to a person, but if um, your knowledge base of what this person carries, the authority of this person, and the, uh, the, the, the majesty of this person, you might, you might just take it like, okay, it's just maybe he just died for our sin, you might not be able to maximize or fully benefit from the fullness of what they carry. So in looking at it, that hell should not be threatening us because we have one who has authority over it or whose power can open the heaven, can flung the heaven open because the powers in the heavens, because without him, there is no heaven. Take away Christ from heaven and heaven is as good as hell. He is the one that makes, it is his presence that makes heaven Heaven. So whether we want to enjoy and open heaven over our families, marriage, career, church, ministry, destiny, nation, we behold him. We behold him until we are formed. We behold him until we are strengthened. I love that song. It just resonates with my spirit. So uh, we look at the person of the Lord Jesus and we said, you have all powers in heaven and on earth. We want open heaven over our nation. Because we believe that is part of your agenda, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we are instituting the kingdom of God. We are making the earth an extension of his kingdom. And how can the kingdom be extended if not by his power, by his might, the presence of the king. And so 
part of our intercessory, um, what I call it assignment, is that we are making it to reflect heaven, colonizing it after the order of our king. What a great job and assignment for us. He's an open refuge that all can run into. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. There is no true safety anywhere aside from his person. None is safe outside of Christ. It's just a matter of time before they get, <laughs> they, they discover that hopefully, they, hopefully not if they take advantage. So he's our refuge. Like we looked at earlier on about how his wings are spread across every spot on the earth. So we take shelter under him. He said that our life is hidden with Christ in God our children, marriages, family, because there's so much, I mean, the trouble that befalls man and humanity are not a few. They are innumerable, whether from the powers of darkness, whether from men. So we need a refuge. We need a sanctuary, a city of, or a person of sanctuary, just like the city of sanctuary in the Old Testament, where um, a manslaughtered person, I mean, a promise you can run into for safety, at least for some time. So it's an open refuge that all can run into. Wrath should not be touching us because it already touched him. The wrath of God, which we merited in the fall of Adam, should not, cannot touch us because it touched him. Maybe from that, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah was, it's almost like the gospel of the Old Testament, so to say. Isaiah chapter 53. If I read from verse 3. He is despised and rejected of man, men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That is, the wrath of God came upon him. That wrath was what we merited, but God poured that wrath on him so that the love of God could flow to us. So, Wrath cannot touch us because it touched him. Sickness should not touch us because it was because it bore our sicknesses. I mean, I'm not saying that believers are not challenged with this, but God expects us to lay hold of what He has done, to thank Him for what He has done. We use what is written to wage warfare against. Just like someone could be denied, that's why we have courts over everywhere on the earth. I mean, human courts. So as that, if a right has been infringed. You, take, you hire a lawyer who will now present your case so that you, a judgment could be given on your behalf. You're in the realm of the spirit. Satan doesn't play fair. He's, uh, he, he, he doesn't have the ground, but he might find a ground. He doesn't have the legal right to do it, but he should, but he can find a ground. It's for sometimes maybe through doors that people create or some things that the, uh, the lineage are done. But we use what, that's why we can't be afraid to be ignorant of the scriptures. We use what is written to change what is happening, to, to place an exemption over us because we are, whatever, uh, whoever is born of God overcomes the world, that uh, those who are in Christ Jesus, we are new creatures in Christ, the old things are passed away. Yes, we declare it and we wage a good warfare that we, uh, we table our case that this is an illegality around us because we are members of the new creation. So the call of the Christian race is not a call to prayerlessness. No, the place of prayer where we are enforcing what is written because we are not ignorant, because the scripture says that by knowledge am a righteous one be justified. So if we don't have knowledge, the things that are not supposed to afflict us might be doing that illegally. So eternity is his day. No age makes his seat void. That is, there is no age dispensation. There's no age of humanity that he sits with ever void. He remains king eternal. He's been king before anything was created. He will remain king after <laughs> everyone is gone if they sought. So in him all power resides. And we're not just talking about spiritual powers alone. We're talking about powers, powers, technological powers, uh, economic power, financial power, uh, marriage mention it and that's why all that's why all powers has been given to me and so that the benefit of beholding him is that we now find that we are saturated with him so i need power in my field you need power in the area god has called you because in this art here we need power to rule by not just um, uh, 
muscular power, so to say. We are talking to be an influence, a light. Light is power, you know that, right? And because light is a function of energy. And so all power resides in him and he gives it to as many that are what? Have their faces turned to him. All power is his to rescue and to satisfy. For who can resist his boundless might? Nobody can resist his boundless might because he is the one that has allocated power to every creature as he deemed fit from his treasure house of power. He is the power of God. You know? that first Corinthians 1 says that God has Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. So he is the might through which God uses. God is his own power. So it's not the power of God is not anything distinct from God himself. So he is the power. So that's why we say that what all power is his to rescue. There is no situation he cannot deliver from. There is no sin or iniquity or challenge or sickness that the Lord cannot rescue from and also to satisfy because power can rescue, power can also elevate. And so that's why our life is a life, the life of the priesthood is a life where we are abiding in him. Abiding meaning that we are living in him. We are living in the reality that is in us and in him. And so what it means is that even when we go to work or in our dealings, our relationship around us and families, we are living from our position in Christ so that our world, everything about our life is a worship, so to say, unto him. Because we now find out that there is a power that is powering our life, not just for ministration alone, not just to preach the gospel, but to live the life of Christ in us, that I have been crucified, that I live, yet not, not that I preach, that Christ preached, yes, Christ will preach through me, but every part of me, there's a fragrance of Christ everywhere I go. So as I saturate every environment with the person of Christ, how enchanting is the tenderness of his heart. If God being God with his power, I don't think, I don't know how many people would draw near to him without the revelation of his love without the, the, the revelation of the tenderness of his heart towards us as sinners. That that's, what, that's what he did to prove it, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Christ dying on the cross was part of God's uh, purpose to reveal the extent. He said, no greater love than this, and a man should lay down his life, so that we will believe in that love and to see the tenderness of his heart and to be able to say, wow, will we, will we, will we sell ourselves and sell in the sense that will we give ourselves only unto you for you have done this for us. We didn't merit it, but he did it for us. His presence can turn the wilderness into a mine of gold, a good man. It is, the, it is not the profitability, so to say, in the eyes of the world that makes any business to be profitable or in, index and those things are wonderful. Yes, we study them, we don't ignore them. But we realize that the, the, that, the, that the horse may be prepared, the chariot may be prepared, but our victory is not on the horses and chariots. It is the presence of God with me in any field that makes that place to be a fruitful ground for me. I'm not saying others could be doing some other things, maybe real estate, so that others could be into certain professions, whether stock market and what have you. I'm not mitigating that. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't acquire assets or be in such uh, space if the opportunity provides. But I don't turn those people have sometimes have turned into a God in the sense that we don't choose the promised land. We don't choose the land. God said, call Abraham, I will show you the land. So, because if the land might not look profitable, so to say, or the field they are God, I believe that Noah's building an ark didn't look like a very profitable venture in these days. So there are many things. So that's why we seek his presence in anything we want to do, because it's not really about whether people will like this product or what have you. It is about is the presence of God with me in this thing that I'm doing. And that's, the, in my own opinion, the most important is the presence of God with me. It might not appear to make sense to men. I'm not saying to me something out of work or anti-scripture, but it, it could be somebody, for example, let's just imagine before they did uh, raisin bread, everybody used to make bread. But someone just had a teaching, why can't we put raisin inside this bread and see how it looks? And it might not have made sense in those days, only for people to have this, wow, this looks nice. And so many things we need to have confidence and that's why we secure his presence in what we do. Without him, we could never survive the assault of Satan and the powers of darkness. There's no, there's no way about it. There's no match for us and Satan. Because <laughs> apart from the fact that our first parents sold us to him, we found that he has actually been longer before humanity. 
So we are no match. So that's why God says we will not allow any temptation to come our way beyond what we can carry. He's the one that regulates that no, this one cannot, this test cannot come towards this my child here. He hasn't grown to that position. And anything that comes our way is because he knows we have the capacity to defeat it. Any situation that we just realize that our God knows that I have the power, I have, I have the solution in me. Now I have to grow to that version of myself that we now do what? That we exercise dominion over that thing, whether in the place of prayer, in the place of study of the word, revelation, light coming in. So compared with him, all other subjects are emptiness and darkness or poison, so to say. <laughs> and when I mean this, because you could look at this and someone could say, maybe a young person, oh, does it mean that math is, is darkness? No. Every subject on this art here, whether in the educational system, whether in the marketplace, any subject that is adding value to humanity is just teaching him in a shadow. So whether people are studying about the stars, he created the stars, he created the sun. So the sun is a teacher of Christ. And sorry, Romans chapter one talks about how uh, how how the invisible the visible things are what they are teaching us about the invisible attributes of God. And of course, all the invisible attributes of God is the reality is the person of Christ. So everything. So whether it is math, the goal of math is the greatest mathematician. How could anyone have created the heavens and the earth without math or science being involved? He's the first scientist. So we are saying that in anything we are doing that. Though it might not be that we are quoting the scriptures or we are learning or our children are learning the scriptures for maths or finding the scripture that talks about algebra and whatever, we are saying that our heart is attuned that Lord, this thing is the dimension of you. I'm not saying that give me a revelation of how you are the quadratic equation, but our heart is like, oh, you are the first mathematician. So it's almost like anything we are now dealing or doing with or coming our way, we are using the lens of Christ to look at it, to deal with such situation. No mind can grant, no tongue can proclaim, no eyes can stand. This treasure of treasures, it is unsearchable. It is far beyond the realm of humanity. It is far beyond the realm of mortals. Before his wisdom, all stand silent. A signature everywhere is a throne. That is the king, eternal, immortal, the Lord over all. Everything belongs to him. We are all, whether saved or unsaved, he said the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. He never was commissioned into the office of creator. And so they are deep. We could say to, we could say part of his work is that his creator is also our savior. Yes, as a savior, we could say he was commissioned to that because he became flesh. He died for us as a lamb of God. There was a time he was not the savior because he hadn't saved us. To be savior means that you had saved people, but we were not yet, even maybe after we fell. And so, but for the office of a creator, and this creator is something like the sustainer of all, it was never commissioned into that. There was never a time he was not creator, and there will never be a time he will still not remain the creator of everything. So those cannot be dethroned from that office. And there are many things that is still intense. It's not creating new works per se, but there are many dimensions of things that, because anything that is going to be created will be based, the raw materials will be what he has really created. So when we're saying about creating, we're saying that we're bringing in innovation, ideas, concept that we give blessing to humanity, whether it is new products in the medical space to, um, to, to, to heal certain sicknesses or in our various fields, whereby we are reflecting this light in no other can this worthiness be found. He whom space cannot hold. Even the heavens of heavens, I think it was Solomon that said, that cannot contain you. And so we find out that, look, this one they're talking about, there's a worthiness of a mayor. It can be compared with the worthiness of uh, a general in the army. So there's a worthiness of a uh, governor. A major, sorry, a mayor cannot be compared with the worthiness of a governor. I mean, a major's worthiness cannot be the worthiness of your hand in general. The worthiness of a governor cannot be compared with the worthiness of the president of that land. And so when we're talking about the person of Christ, we are talking about an all-surpassing worthiness. That is, there is nothing higher. It's inconceivable for anything to be above God. He rules over the heavens and the earth. In no other this worthiness can be found. He is he whose side the angels veil their faces. Not all the angels can behold him. And that's why those two cherubims that are covering the mercy seat. And so it's a privilege 
for us to be invited to come to his presence. And I'm not saying that we're seeing him physically or anything, but we're saying that it's a privilege to be called to his presence, to stand before him. And to stand before him, I believe, part of the big reason is that so that we can stand in the gap, we can intercede. It's not really for ourselves alone, like in a selfish interest. It's for us to intercede for the land, to intercede for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, in a place of intercession, to find out what is in his heart. So we are almost like a servant waiting on our master. What would you want to see reflected in this dispensation, in this period, in this season? In him is righteousness which satisfies the law. And as Paul was saying in Romans chapter 10, that no man is justified, by, which is essentially the theme of um, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10 talks about uh, brethren, I bear them, verse 2, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going, they are going about to establish their own righteousness, having submitted themselves, on, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to them that believe. It is the righteousness that satisfies every requirement of the law. It gives wisdom that subverts all perplexity. So there's no situation, there's no season that I can be in life. He's not the wisdom to get out of it. And so our beholding Him, our abiding in Him is unceasing. Except we want to dry up, except we want to be on fruitful branches. So every season, every, there's a wisdom for every season. There's a wisdom for every situation. There's a wisdom for every relationship. There's a wisdom for every task. And but it doesn't, it, it, not that we get all the wisdom at once, it's by our beholding him, he unconsciously many times leads us into the wisdom for that situation. And because if you don't act in wisdom, what happens is like you're going to fall into trouble, there'll be all kinds of attack, you find dryness everywhere. So he gives wisdom that subverts all perplexity, whether it is a national perplexity, whether it is a, that's why one of the, uh, the, the foremost thing you will find the Spirit of God leading us to pray is to pray for the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know, even God said in James that if any man lacks wisdom, let him call upon. Because we will come across situations that our human intelligence cannot handle, that only the wisdom of God can solve it. That's why we behold Him. He guides to a city of eternal habitation, which is the New Jerusalem. So everything He's doing with us is because He's guiding us into that eternal home which we will be with Him. So every step we are taking every day, our thoughts, our words, the goal of God is that actually bringing us into, because He Himself is the reality of that New Jerusalem, that is the, He's bringing us to Himself so that we can reflect Him and express Him wherever we are. So, he wants to guide our family, he wants to guide our nations, he wants to guide his church into a city of eternal habitation, a city that cannot be destroyed, a city whose light is not the sun, but God himself in the person of Christ. That's why in that Revelation 22, it talks about he is the light, 21 and 22, he is the light of that city, a city paved, I could say, with gold or precious stones. Who can declare his greatness? In every sense, it is unsearchable. It is beyond the reach of any mortal. And so that's why what we have seen that we call greatness is probably just a minute dimension of this person. And that's why there is no end to it. That's why Psalm 145, David talks about how unsearchable are your greatness. Who can declare his greatness in every sense? It is unsearchable. It is beyond, it has no beginning. It ha this is greatness without origin. This is greatness without support. Some people are great because maybe they acquire certain knowledge, skills, or they have certain support system around them. There is no such with this person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Himself is his own support. His power is ours that we may never be defeated. That's one of his goal for us, that nothing should floor us. And if it does, it's because we drop the ball somewhere on the other. And of course, he expects us to pick up ourselves because we are talking about omnipotence, the power he has given to us so that we are ruling in the affairs of men. I mean, ruling for our king, ruling in the place he has called us to be. So 
its power is now so that not for us to abuse and think we can just use it for our own selfish motive or so. He said it's the one that gives power to make wealth. So there's a power to make wealth, there's a power to have an influence on the earth. And of course, we end our last page on today that his salvation, his throne of salvation, nobody can contend with it. He alone is on the salvation throne or on the throne of salvation, for in no other name can man be saved except through him. He alone sits on salvation's throne. We could talk about the person of Christ and the whole of eternity will never be enough to talk about his worthiness. It is inexhaustible. So today we've been able to look at the topic Christ also passing worthiness. We said that that Christ, nobody can fully portray the beauties of Christ's person, character and works. In him, deity was ruled. He, was, he came to become his God in our nature taking our place in death so as to bring us to his place in life and immortality. And so today, we are living because he is the one that is living his life through our life. Every part of our life we owe to him. Our existence, our sustenance, his priesthood over our life, is the wisdom of God. Everything that he is, is to see to the fact that we become the vessels that God has created of. We are vessels of mercy because it is the mercy of God based on His finished work. So every day we are acknowledging Him, we are beholding Him, we are what? We are giving thanks to God through His person because without Him, we are no match for the powers of darkness. We could never survive the assaults that will be coming from the satanic rage. In Him resides all power, omnipotence is His signature everywhere. His presence everywhere is so that he will have preeminence over all things. What a joy to the greatness and the wonders of our amazing Lord and Savior. Hallelujah to God the Father. Hallelujah to God the Son. Hallelujah to God the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.